are opioids that will cause you seizures when you give them, Altram, Nucenta, Demerol, all of these will give you seizures. And so you have to be careful what you are prescribing and how it interacts with the other medications. Applying our information into the wrong settings is what gets us in trouble. Um, we go to the outpatient. All of this was inpatient. All of this was stuff that you are not really interacting with somebody that's coming for a few minutes in your, op in your clinic and leaving. All of this did not basically prepare you for what you see in an outpatient basis. Uh, most of the time, people get in trouble Friday around 4.30 p.m., the last patient, and that patient is going to be uh, 65 years old with the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. She, her life is, sucks. Uh, doctors do not listen to her, and Lortab is the only thing that helped her. Of course, her previous doctor just up and left his practice and abandoned her, and she has only two pills left. She is not an addict, churchgoer, and she was able to stress the medication until this appointment. She heard that you are the best doctor in town, that you listen in compassion, and you like to help your patient, she's here for you to help her. But she only wants what she knows work for her. Our first option is basically easy, but makes your life difficult afterwards. I don't have time to sort all of this. We'll give her a prescription until I see her next time. I will sort out these issues then. A short review of the situation next time, the patient will be on the same drug for about a year with no changes. And then one day you're going to get a letter from the state of Tennessee saying that you are one of the highest 50 prescribers of the state, and then you decide that you cannot prescribe, and basically we refer her to the pain clinic. Second option, will take uh, care of things the correct way and not easy, make life simpler later on. Calm down, know that this is part of the deal. Actually, a lot of people deal with the Friday around 4.30 problem is by closing the office at noon or actually not working on Friday altogether. <laughs> uh, you have to, have to follow a well-worn path to give a, give a prescription. Let the patient sign record release, get her back when you have time and information to make an intelligent decision. This is not going to be easy because you have to get her out of that office and know what's really happening here. You cannot just give her a prescription, tell her I'm going, I will see you back and stuff. Get medical record, discover that the doctor's clinic closed pending investigation by the DA and the FBI. All tests were negative. Fibromyalgia diagnosis was given at one time, but there, there was no examination to substantiate that diagnosis, and no fibromyalgia approved drugs even tried. All what she got is just the Lord help. The correct way of looking at the situation or in an outpatient, your goals approach is different than an acute care facility. What the last doctor did is not a pathway for you to repeat. Here are the points that you need to cover in outpatient history. Red flags of misuse, abuse, addiction, diversion. Pain history, where is the pain? What makes it worse? How, when the injury happened or the pain came about? What tests were done? Do we have pathology, litigation, psychiatric history? And your physical red flags, basically patients that you need to send to the hospital now, incontinence, bowel, bladder, foot drop. Patient have fever at night, maybe they have cancer. Do you have history of addiction, prior pain, suboxone clinics or methadone clinics now? What happened there? Does the patient take street drugs that are selling drugs? History of incarceration for selling or forging prescriptions. Psychiatric history, suicide, overdose, bipolar, paranoia, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, personality disorders. Patients with psychiatric issues have physical issues, although they may use opioids to cover for their psychiatric issues. And we see a lot of that. Social history, any addicts living with the patient, any teenagers living with the patient. This is where the high school drugs comes from. Grandma closet. Any history of drugs stolen? How the patient will secure the drugs once prescribed? Check the database. database. Wealth of information about who's prescribing and what and when. I can guarantee you that when you do the urine drug screen that the Norco prescription that was prescribed a year ago is going to show up in that urine screen. How you're going to handle that? You have to have a plan about how you are going to approach this. 
Why do you feel pressed to write prescription before getting all the information? Most of these patients are quite manipulative. They will push your button. You need to look into yourself and see why you are doing what you are doing. Is there other modalities or other treatments that need to be done? What do you do when the patient is just focused on meds and refuses other modalities? You have to have a plan. You cannot just sit in front of the patient and try to figure it out. Is this addiction, pseudo-addiction, drug-seeking behavior, or just personality issue, and the patient doesn't like change and afraid of getting better? And a lot of people are afraid of getting better. What is the examination, tests were done? What do they show? Does it make sense what the patient complaining about goes with what you think they should be complaining about? Do we have a diagnosis to support us writing opioids? By the way, lumbago, pain syndrome, fibromyalgia are not diagnoses that support prescribing opioids. There are symptoms with codes that so you can bill. These med that are medical value is nil. If I tell you I see somebody today with lumbago, what does that mean? Patient complaining of pain. If you cannot diagnose it, do not prescribe for it. Tennessee guideline mentioned that you need a diagnosis to prescribe. You need to get a urine drug screen at the initiation of treatment. Be sure you know what kind of urine drug screen you are getting and what it shows. There is a difference between screening tests, which is enzymatic tests, and confirmation tests, which is chromatography test. Have a plan when on what you do when you have aberration, as you will have that more often than not. Usual excuses, took medication from a friend, had prescribed it to me in the past, just found one in the bottle, actually, or actually when you, somebody passed the THC, it was like, I just came from California. It was legal there. So what do you do? <laughs> the most common drug screen done is Federal 5. Do you know what is the federal file and why they are useless? They are actually the Department of Transportation uh, way of screening truckers. This is a five panel regime, regime. It is enzymatic, it is not confirmatory. It is basically marijuana, cocaine, amphetamine, opioids. Actually, it does not include oxycodone, fentanyl, tramadol, or tapendolol. If you are going to be prescribing, you need to get specifically these drug requested, and PCP. What is used in your ER? Most of the ER have federal five because they don't want to deal with any drugs issues with insurance companies and so they can get paid. CDC and T Tennessee guideline does not prevent PCPs from prescribing opioids. It just wants you to be cautious, understand why you are prescribing, and can support your prescription with medical evidence. You can treat acute pain with opioids, limited amount with gold started, stated clearly. In Tennessee, it is not only opioid that you get tagged with. Benzodiazepines, including sleep aid, Ambien, and Soma are all part of the mix. If you have more than 50% of your practice, you have to become registered as a pain clinic, and so you have to be careful what else you are prescribing. It is not just narcotics. You have a ceiling of 120 morphemal equivalent, and that ceiling is actually getting lower. Actually, in Washington, it is going down to 90. Think of opioid like prescribing insulin. You will not prescribe insulin except when you have a solid diagnosis, tried other modalities of treatment, and it did not work. You will not prescribe an insulin to a patient that comes and tells you that they love it when they go hypoglycemic as it puts them in twilight zone, and they love that feeling. Also, insulin on an inpatient is to control blood sugar, prevent, di prevent diabetic ketoacidosis, ICU admission. Uh, an outpatient get longer term A1C lower, prevent infection and comorbid diseases. Two different ways with one drug. Short-acting insulin is a guideline for your total daily dose. You try to switch to long-acting insulin to have a better control. Controversies. Basically, uh, this, I don't know if I want to do that, but you know, be critical of the information that you get. There's a lot of studies out there. A study done in Canada, Pakistan is different than the ones done in the US. There is difference in culture, acceptance of social norms, difference in malpractice patterns, is it socialized medicine, free fee for service. Uh, one study that I read comes from Norway. The marker of hard physical labor is sweating outside. Does that actually apply to us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Most studies are done for three purposes. Industry sponsor, and so they can support their product, and so they can come and tell you, we have these wonderful studies that says this. Uh, there are student, university, faculty doing it to put it on their resume, may or may not answer a question, mostly done to increase CV credibility, and then to answer a real question. Studies done with grant money, they are more esoteric and academic, that you hardly find an answer with. How many studies are proper? double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and then get debunked in clinical practice. You have to look at the studies and what is the inclusion-exclusion criteria. How did they do their method? All of this, you know, not just double-blind, placebo-controlled. You have to look into real study, what, the, what it is, was done, and so you can actually quote it. Know your doctor. Uh, basically, pain clinics are referral clinics, they are like cardiology. You don't just send the patient to cardiology because they have chest pain. Work them up. Uh, pain clinics are specialist clinics. Treat them like cardiology. Referral, use them appropriately. Your expectation or you will shape your experience. Patient expectation also will shape your experience. Also, you have to counsel them about what's reasonable, realistic, and what is not. Somebody that comes and wants to do stuff that their body is not going to allow them to do and they want you to cover it up with pain medication is not a realistic thing. You have to counsel them that this is not a realistic thing. Uh, unregulated world is pain and addiction. Both of them are outpatient. Uh, there is no need for hospital reviewing credentials. Usually this is the fourth second career for a troubled doctor, somebody that cannot practice in a hospital. Um, they are forcing now basically pain uh, world to become regulated and so now they are trying to control who can claim that they are pain doctor and I call other doctor pseudo pain doctor. Now you have the addiction. Actually a lot of the addiction doctors now are not, uh, did not do any uh, fellowship training. Most of them they go to a private uh, board and they get board certified by these private boards. You have to be careful how, who you are sending this. Um, this is another $1.1 billion in addiction, and it is basically to support medication maintenance programs for addicts. Uh, the pain world has good doctors and bad doctors. The bad ones are really bad. They are usually the ones that cause bad reputation and usually are the ones that will create issues long term as they will move and or change their focus every so often, and you will find a lot of misuse and abuse in that area. The good doctors do not want to get involved in taking care of patients that went to the bad doctors. Patients which have problems seek bad doctors, and they tell each other. That's why the internet is there. Uh, <laughs> they actually tell each other, and they go, and most of these other guys are, have open doors, and they will happy to prescribe opioids for money. Usual mistakes seen when referring to a multidisciplinary pain clinic. There is no personal communication. Actually, you don't know your doctor. You don't know who you're referring to. Um, nobody even talk. This is actually part of the remnant of the hospital practices, consult, orthopedics. Whoever is on call, take care of it. That is not the case in our patient. I would suggest that you know who you are referring the patient to. Actually talk to them. <coughs> Very late referrals is almost always done. Let's take a case of shingles. Not responding to usual anti-shingle measures, referrals is almost all, always, usually, six months late. If it is acute, it needs to be addressed acutely. The goal of treatment is to prevent acute injury from becoming chronic. If no pain relief within four to six weeks, referral to interventional pain clinic is warranted. Sympathetic blocks in various forms, usually abort pain and, and post-shingles pain. This is well known in pain community, but not on the PCP side. Nobody really go out and do it. We are too busy doing what we do that we did not even go out and tell primary cares, we can help you with this. Don't wait on six months down the road. Acute radiculopathy usually respond to some medications, not always opioids. 
The patient goes to physical therapy. They are non-responder. They go back to the primary care. They go back to orthopedics, neurosurgery, which is also inherited from hospital practices. And then the neurosurgery will send them to us. We will do whatever we can to help them. If that does not help them, they go back to the surgeon. They do surgery. How many time and effort has been done through this? Usually referral is done as a punishment to a patient that they had aberration with their UDS. Why the referral was not done prior to that point? Referral is done to the clinic that will provide the path of least resistance, give pain medication without offering other options, and when that clinic goes out of business or drop out of insurance, possibly as the insurance company is auditing their pattern, a referral is done to a multi-specialty pain clinic. I will tell you, refer back. Good doctors do not interested in seeing bad doctor's patients. Here is the secret. Usual clinic patients, 95% of the patient are patients looking for good medical care. Usually things are well-defined, smooth with them, and you can get to a goal. 5% are usually troubled. By contrast, you will spend 95% of your time dealing with the troubled one, and they will drain your energy and will let you wonder why you are doing this job. If you do a good job at the front end, the back end will take care of itself. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I think I was too fast. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Yes. I think, I think the characterization of addiction is misrepresented. Addiction is compulsive use of medication despite harm. So actually when you have somebody that comes to you that you are prescribing opioids for them because they have, let's say they have had surgery on their back they're still having back pain, they have cardiac issues and they are on Plavix, and they have COPD on oxygen. What are you going to do with those? You may prescribe opioids. Does that mean that that patient is addicted? No, this is basically like treating hypertension. They become physically dependent, which basically, if you take the opioid out of their system, they will have withdrawal symptoms. Same thing like when you take antihypertensive, they will shoot up. That does not even equal addiction. I think the issue that you are getting through the media is everybody getting opioids is getting addicted, which is not the case. The spectrum of addiction within the pain world is the same like a regular world five to seven percent. So, but you have to be careful about evaluating and saying why you are giving this and what is your goals and why you, why you cannot do any alternatives to do this. Whenever I have patients come and they have no diagnosis, really, basically it is symptoms, lumbago, complaining of back pain, and they have been on pain medications for five, seven years. Are these people are addicted, or actually, this is actually pseudo addiction, which basically they are seeking treatment, but the person that they sought was giving them only opioids, and then now they became, this is the only thing that I know what it works. Is that pseudo addiction? So that's my view of it. I do not see it as addiction in the form of somebody's using it. There are addicts that actually use pain medication, but that is not always synonymous. Does that answer your question? Sure. There's a lot of discussion about primary care under-treating pain in some cases. You know, there are, there's addiction is an issue, but some physicians are afraid to get pain medicine, thinking, oh my God, I have trouble with the I think the person that is afraid of that they're going to get in trouble, they're usually, they were undereducated about what they need to do or what, how they can do it. And that goes back 
to training programs, but also communication between that physician and their, you know, referring doctor like me, like a pain doctor. I have actually primary care physician called me and says, I don't know what to do here. And then we had to work out a plan with patients. And really, we, as a pain clinic, I don't want to be the refill center of Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. My role is actually to empower you to write the, the opioids or to do whatever it needs to be for that patient. And so I see them, I evaluate them, and then we come up with a plan. And if the plan is chronic opioids, we will return them back to the primary care with the letter saying, I will be glad to see them back. And when we see them back, you know, a year or two, because things change as time goes, you know, they may be fine today, but there is an issue later on. Um, and so my role is to come up with a plan, support you in whatever you are doing, and help the patient in actually getting what they need to get. But opioids is not always the treatment that we will recommend. Some patients anti-seizure medication, some patients antidepressants, some patients need long-term therapy. And so that's sometimes is the issue is the patient wants one thing and our recommendation is something else. You are caught in the middle. So which one do you want to go with? That will become the primary care uh, comfort level and education and training. Any more? Yes. One of the main problems we face in the hospital is uh, patients who get admitted, they are on high dose pain medication without a real diagnosis, like an outpatient. Now, a big part of reimbursement uh, is patient satisfaction. Yes. So we're in the middle between thinking that this is not the proper dose and not the proper treatment, but we're in the hospital, we're in an acute setting, and between the patient satisfaction. And sometimes the reason for admission is actually because of such high dose. Yeah. So any advice on how to deal with such situations? Because uh, we're often faced by a lot of pain. The question is, is basically if you are in the acute setting in a hospital and This is a, the body actually has just have changed. And so you, and your role is going to be get them back where they are. If this is just a suicide or is uh, somebody that is taking street drugs and other things, at that point you have to treat it as, a, as overdose issue and then you can treat it that way. That's how I can answer it. Does that answer you? Yes. treatment for pain, um, and you do a urine drug screen for whatever reason, and you find that there are other things in the urine that should not be there. What is your obligation um, as a physician uh, to report this? Most of these people who are on chronic narcotic um, treatment usually have a pain contract, which they have then violated. Are you obligated to notify the uh, treating physician? Yes, I will, I will notify the treating physician, but at the same time you have no obligation to report it to the state or any other agency. Does one have the obligation to report to the court? 
clinic or the physician? It will be a good medical practice to report it to the prescribing physician. And I will, I've seen patients coming from primary care for the one time or two time visit to that every year or two years, I do a urine drug screen and it is having aberration. And at that time I go back to the PCP and say there is an aberration, I need to see them back. And so I will know why there is aberration here. But you are dealing with stuff that they actually will tell you what is the chain of command is going to be. So uh, reporting to the authorities is not obligation, but I think in medical practice you should, you know, uh, send a note to the uh, prescribing doctor. In, in your clinic, uh, pain clinic with chronic pain or what have you, um, for non-cancer uh, chronic pain, is it still recommended to be um, on long-acting um, opioids as opposed to quick-acting? Yes. We always go with the patient to go for the long-acting opioids, not the short-acting. The problem with the short-acting is it does two, two issues. One of them is it encourages pill-taking behavior. And that in itself encourages that you become dependent on taking the medication on certain times or certain things. Or as a coping mechanism, I feel uh, tired now, I will take one and so I will feel better. That's basically what we are trying to avoid. Uh, we, we recommend long acting. We do not recommend short acting with the long acting. Uh, the issue with the uh, going back to the breakthrough pain, this is not happening in the non-cancers. They have what is called acute pain, which is basically they have pain in, on top Why they are on suboxone? Uh, uh, recovery, yeah. yeah. If if you have a if you have somebody already in addiction recovery, I think you have to treat them like addicts. You have to evaluate what why they are complaining of pain, and if it is reasonable, you can rescue them for a short period of time, but not for long term. But at the same time, I do not think it is reasonable to substitute their suboxone with lung with opioid medication, get them out of the hospital on that. Yes? Do you know if Suboxone or some that shows up on a urine drug screen? Do you have to uh, ask for it specifically? And like I say, actually, you have to go back to the um, mass spec and ask for everything that you want to show up. 
um, relying that sending this to the lab for a urine drug screen will not get you the information that you want, especially with the fentanyl, especially in your center, especially with the suboxone. Naloxone is not going to show up. Altram will not show up. Uh, so you have to ask specifically for what you want to get out of the lab. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I will actually offer other than opioids for, a, for an addicted patient. Most of them, they use the opioids to cover for the street drug or whatever they have addiction for. And so basically I will try to do other things. I'll try to do injections. I'll send them to therapy, physical therapy or actually psychological therapy. Uh, but I will not be, that will not be my first line of treatment if they have addic addiction already uh, diagnosed. Okay. Sorry I went uh, too fast on these, but uh, maybe, maybe you guys will get uh, out of here. <laughs> Maybe next year or so, if you are interested, we will invite you again. Sure. Okay. Sure. I have your cell number. I'll text you. I'm Sam. Yeah, Lance. Hi, Lance. Question on Sidbox. Sure. When it first came.